What does Richard Harvey, a recent power player in the city of London, have to do with this man, a farmer in Ghana? Beyond the environmental devastation, beyond the human poverty, they both see the development potential for growing business in Africa. Boys, and I'm in Ghana, West Africa, a country on the front line of climate change. Now, this is where Richard Harvey, the former CEO of Aviva, is spending a week out of his year-long travels to some of the African continent's most challenged regions. He's let us come along for the ride. These are the red dirt roads of Ghana's Upper West region, the youngest of the country's 10 regions, and also the poorest. These are the roads Richard Harvey and I will travel over the next few days, the communities we'll visit, to discover firsthand the challenges and the opportunities in this final frontier of emerging markets. It's just a besetting problem. Why is it still as difficult here as it was 20 years ago? Ghana and Malaysia had the same living standards uh, 20 years ago. Now Malaysia is 13 times better off on average per person than Ghana, which is, which, uh, you know, Ghana has been left behind and we need to help it help Ghana and other parts of Africa catch up. Um, okay, with gap years and sabbaticals, a key talking point today. On account Richard made headlines in 2007 when he stunned the business world and stepped down after 10 years of running global insurance giant Aviva. At the youthful age of 57, and with wife Kay by his side, Richard decided to take the gap year he never had and do volunteer work in Africa for the charity Concern Universal. Their journey has taken them to the remote reaches of Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, and now Ghana. This is beyond the back of beyond. Some people might say we're crazy, but now we have more to offer than we would have done as, as young people. There's been some, some real kind of hands-on stuff because I wanted to get out of this sort of, you know, white-handed, soft, soft, soft-fingered thing behind the desk and actually try and see what it was like. Here in Ghana, what we see right away is that the country, like the rest of Africa, is under assault from the destructive effects of climate change. Yeah, look, this is a pretty dry riverbed here. Yeah. Whoops. So this okay. is the area that the flooding yeah. occurred. Whoops. Hold on. We've come upon the dried river crossing. There used to be a bridge here, but a flash flood wiped it away, leaving just pockets of soft sand and stagnant water. Oh, wow. Wow. God, it's pretty scorching. Vast as well. Scorching indeed. I mean, you can, you can really, you really feel the impact, don't you, when, when you're out here? I mean, this. Yeah. All, all the flooding. And remember in this area they've come from massive drought, absolutely devastating drought because they've seen the global warming from climate change. Areas got really dry, really arid. This used to be a great forest all around us. All of that is gone. And then out of the blue, we get the other, the volatility of the climate change. They get a downpour that even this incredibly arid ground can't absorb, whoosh, and it takes away their schools, their houses, um, their crops, just about everything they've got. As the former boss of Aviva, Britain's biggest insurer and number five in the world, Richard knows a thing or two about dealing with the aftermath of floods. But here, their impact is much more devastating. All of this took place in an area where people don't have insurance. No, well, absolutely not. Not, in, not in, no insurance, but of course, when it comes to working on the prevention. Whereas in the UK, we've got the Department of the Environment, the insurance companies getting together and really pressurising for things to happen, defences to be improved. Here, the local community, basically assisted by, by NGOs like Concern Universal, they've got to find ways of helping themselves, reforesting, putting in plants to retain the soil, anything to lower the risk profile. No such preventative measures have taken root here yet. Another torrent of rain could wash over this already vulnerable land and make the area completely impassable. And as we find out, 
When storm clouds come, when the sky opens up and lets loose, the rain here can be like a wall of water. But even though it's the rainy season, this is the only time we actually see rain during our visit. The usual view is mile after mile of sun-parched, water-starved land. Climate change is making a bad situation worse. Northern Ghana has had five consecutive years of above average temperatures and below average rainfall, as much as 40% below, making it more susceptible to severe and unpredictable weather events and more unforgiving to the people in the villages. This is a grain silo. It's used to store grain. Usually it would be full to the brim. However, due to the erratic rainfalls, due to the severe flooding, it's now empty, as you just saw. Food is a hard thing to come by. The inconvenient truth is that the burden of climate change falls on Africa's poor. Yet as the lowest carbon emitter globally, it's not Africa's carbon production that has done this. It's the rest of the world's and Africa must adapt. If communities in Africa do not adapt successfully to climate change, there's going to be more flooding, there's going to be more drought, and there's going to be acute numbers of people in real starvation and, and facing great misery. <laughs> we arrive at the Manwe community in Wa. Oh, it's just down here on the left. Okay. This is where Concern Universal, alongside the local organization ProNet, has helped create a dry season vegetable garden. It's a sustainable solution to climate change and poverty that's more permanent and cost effective than just dumping bags of food out of a plane. Food aid has a place in terms of responding to emergencies. However, food aid, from the point of view of creating dependency, is the wrong way around. It needs to be turned on its head. Communities really need to make sure that they can grow their own food, using their own water, using their own systems, then they can be more resilient against disasters. This garden was a recovery response in the wake of the 2007 floods. The initial investment? A supply of seeds, fertilizer and gardening tools some instruction on how to use them, how to dig a well and irrigate, and how to keep records. The potential payoff? The hope is this garden will not only yield a harvest during the so-called hungry season, when there's no rain, but an actual cash crop like these peppers, and the start of a small enterprise culture. Can you tell me how much a kilogram of this will, will sell for? 30,000. 30,000, huh? In three dollars? Three dollars, three dollars, yeah. So you can get a kilogram of this. If you can grow a kilogram of this, you can get three dollars. The farmer tells Richard the entire garden could net three hundred dollars at market. This operation is in its early stages and quite modest compared to the FTSE 100 company Richard left behind, but Concern Universal is betting that business can make a real difference here. The biggest thing that somebody like Richard brings is the link between a big business like Aviva and what a farmer within a community is doing. The key thing is for the farmer to know what is needed when. So for example, there will be a time when the communities or the market, what it needs is tomatoes. So the farmer has to deduce at that stage, let me grow tomato, which is going to sell. So it's meeting food security within the home, but also enabling the farmer to be able to sell and gain more income. So you look now at the farmer more of a business person. While we're at the garden, we catch sight of one of the banes of Africa's existence, a bushfire. You can just about catch the flame from here. Yeah. It's horribly close to the sustainable dry farming that's just started. You're absolutely right. It's close to the new farming. It's very common for these bushfires to get out of control. The terrain makes easy prey here, where flames feast on the delicate and dry trees and brush. Yet all too often, the cause is all too human. 
there's been an unfortunate habit here of using bushfires to clear away the land. Absolutely disastrous, completely unsustainable, very bad for the climate. And one of the things that, that development organisations like Concern Universal are really trying hard to educate people out of. And then just over, you know, behind our back here, we've got very limited water supply. And what can we see happening? The cows are going straight in the water. And that really makes it a great source of infection. Drink everybody water. Up. It, people yeah. are going to use this for irrigation, for drinking, for washing. If they're smart, they'll be uh, they'll be boiling it. But most people won't have the fuel to boil it. If they do need to boil it, then it's more more carbon, more climate change. Water is the other bane of Africa's existence, and the two, fire and water, are a calamitous combination. Less than half of Ghana's rural populations have access to water suitable for drinking. Most people here drink whatever's collected from the watering holes and small lakes. They realize it's unsanitary, even dangerous to their health, but they don't have a choice. Okay, all right. What are they saying, Mr. What, what are they saying? No, the women are actually saying they want to have safe water. This is where they come to take water for use within the home. They are competing with animals and they're saying we want safe water because once that is done, it prevents waterborne diseases. The struggle here is not just about water quality, but also water availability. We drive to a place where the community tried to dig deep into the earth for water. The director of ProNet North, Martin Derry, shows me what the country's water crisis looks like below the earth's surface. So what are we looking at here? What we're looking at here is a dry borehole. A borehole is a, a, a shaft dug underground to meet with the water table so that water can be pumped out. We're expecting to meet the water table before 60 meters, but we dug deeper than 90 meters and we did not get any water. So you went all the way down beyond 90 meters and all you got was, was dust? Yeah. When the rains don't come, a single borehole like this would be enough to meet the water needs of three to 400 people. But this community has over 1,000. What does a project like this mean for your community and what does it mean when it fails? In fact, that day, if you were here, the entire community was around here, hoping and praying that there would be some water. Because they have only one borehole, which is clearly insufficient for their water requirements. So when we went deeper than 90 meters and we did not get water, it was, uh, as we say locally here, it was, it was like a funeral. Mm. It affects their education. Girls cannot go to school when there's no water. Girls have to fetch enough water for the home before they get a chance to go to school. Without sufficient community boreholes, they often have to walk long distances to get even the animal contaminated water we saw earlier. But soon, that too may dry up. Experts predict that climate change will cause water flow into the major basins in Ghana to diminish by as much as 40% by 2050. There are no easy solutions, no quick fixes. To solve the steady stream of issues here will require more than just water pumps and boreholes. The sharp, fast, easy to measure interventions actually are those that last the least long. So sticking boreholes in the ground. Terribly worthy objective, but it isn't going to change how people live. You can make a permanent change if it starts from the bottom up. For a former FTSE boss like Richard, from the bottom up means from business down, and that means microfinance and trade. Africa needs to develop to a point where it's a commercial proposition. Back on the road, our journey across Ghana continues. According to Richard Harvey, true trailblazing here must start with commodities and commerce driving economic growth. <laughs> we arrive at the Lambusier Community Farm. Agriculture is a way of life and livelihood for 86% of the people in rural Ghana. And as we've seen, it's potentially a way of business. This farm is taking agriculture to the next level as a planned, profit-making venture. Most of what is sown here is for trade. Owner Tong gives Richard a tour. This onion, 
Yeah. Not only does this farm grow all kinds of vegetables and fruits, but it also sprouts its own seed supply. These onion stalks are harvested not for market, but for their seeds, a strategy that sacrifices short-term profits, but reaps long-term rewards. Yes. So though you'll be losing um, at the market, yeah. but you are getting your own seed, yeah. because the seed now is very expensive. Small and medium farm enterprises like this are cultivating a better business model and way of life in rural communities. You know, the old rule in any business, I do what I see my boss doing. So this gives local people something to aspire to, a better way of doing things, and draws in people who would otherwise drift out of this part of the world, maybe down to some of the urban sprawl in search of extra work. This farming operation may be larger, lusher, and more ambitious than the dry season garden we visited earlier, but the challenges are the same. All around us, just outside the farm's fences, is proof of how climate change has ravaged and transformed this land in a relatively short period of time. Just 35 years ago, this entire area, believe it or not, used to be forest. I was told that crocodiles used to be a hazard here. And just 10 years ago, some people in the region, they used to catch frogs and sometimes eat them. And now, what do you have? Very, very dry, barren, hard soil. Different place, same soil, same story. Just like digging for boreholes, farming here is a constant battle to reclaim the land. As we leave, we pass a small pond, a reminder of what this terrain used to look like. The crocodiles, though, have long gone. We move on, eager to see where the farm's food basket ends up. Produce from local growers is sold roadside in towns and also at the larger markets. This move into the world of commerce and competition is a significant stepping stone for people to eventually trade their food internationally and fetch higher prices. Trading their way out of difficulty is crucial for Africa. We're not talking about creating a continent that is going to be a permanent recipient of aid. That, that's a disaster for the world. It's, 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 it's a disaster for the people here uh, and it creates entirely the wrong um, culture within, within the society. Richard and I next head out to Jirapa to visit the Janvuri community for a look at a microfinance project helping to support the community and empower its women. The majority of Ghana is best known for its cocoa, but here in the upper west region of the country, where it's a lot drier, they're counting on Shia butter made from the Shia nut as potential big export business. Shia butter is the key ingredient in beauty creams and cosmetics marketed for their moisturizing ability and skin softening effects. You can feel the sort of butter in it already. From this mud hut production base, women churn, crush and grind the nuts into shea butter in a back-breaking, seven-stage, all-day marathon in the blistering heat. I mean, it's, it's very, very hot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 at this stage, it's very hot. Yeah. yeah, well, we're standing at about 40 degrees yeah. in the shade, I guess, and then we've got a little fire going underneath, so this is, this is pretty warm work. All this warm work results in a big bowl of unrefined shea butter. Could you ask the woman, do they find that there are many people that are willing to pay for these products now? Okay. That's uh, locally, people come to buy for cooking. But moving it out of their community, then they can sell it better. Big buyers of West Africa's Shia butter include global beauty giants L'Oreal, L'Occitane, and The Body Shop. But here in Janvuri, machinery and some good old business backing are still needed to supply that caliber of clientele. So this is a prime example of microfinancing where it's best? Yeah, microfinance has, has, has started this product and the opportunity is for it to grow essentially into an international business. This is one of the things that Africa can do and has an almost unlimited capacity for expansion. So where's the sticking point? Simply the availability, you know, we are absolutely at the far end of Ghana. Just bringing the small amount of money here is going to cost a fair bit of money in transport and then people only want to borrow $10. So getting a scale is quite difficult. But as the activity in the area builds up, you start to get into a virtuous spiral in which your overheads start to fall because you've got more loans. And 
if you can, you want to make a large portion of your loans to women because they seem to be, experience has shown across Africa, much better at using the money responsibly, running the business well, and understanding that if they pay this loan back, then next time they can borrow some more. And Richard tells me there's an added benefit to supporting the Shia butter business in particular. It's a business which is also great for the environment, encouraging the planting of these trees, which in turn is helping with temperature and with rain and with soil erosion. While demand for Shia butter may help with the reforestation of trees, most of what we see in Ghana is the reverse, deforestation, even in the greener south. We see the impact wherever we go in, in Africa. This area used to be covered with trees. Now there's just one lone tree left standing and the tree line has receded. Almost 2% or 22,000 hectares of Ghana's forest are depleted every year. It's dreadful. It's like the rape of the planet, actually. Trees fall victim to the common practice of slash and burn agriculture and hunting. Others are chopped down for firewood. During our travels, we constantly come across women carrying stacks of wood. If you go into the village itself, you find also heaps of firewood, because it's a symbol of a woman's, a married woman's resourcefulness, if she has a good heap of firewood. The amount of wood a woman has piled outside her home is a measure of her status in the community. Wood equals wealth here. And wood also equals fuel. It's often burned for charcoal. Wood fuel consumption provides a staggering 70% of Ghana's total energy supply. In rural parts where there's limited access to modern energy sources like gas or electricity, more than 90% of households use firewood for charcoal or cooking. This reliance on trees is extensive. Beyond the home, wood and charcoal fuel businesses. From informal enterprises such as the making of local brews and grain alcohol, to commercial logging and timber exporting. We see truck after truck loaded down with trees. At the current rate, Ghana is likely to consume more than 25 million tons of wood fuel by 2020. All such practices lead to degradation of the forest, and fewer trees means less rain. And all this means a serious threat to the ecosystems of the country. Natural habitats and wildlife could be lost. And that's going to have an impact to a global level. Deforestation is going to affect us all. We can't sit by and just let this deforestation occur without our active involvement. That means getting the local people actively involved and invested in the process. It's a simple point, but one that outside organizations often miss. If those local communities are not in the driver's seat, then all the efforts that we bring in terms of resources, technical advice, strategic advice, just becomes like a, a big rug being pulled from under, under those communities. They have to have an ownership and a participation and a belief that it's really coming from them. Our journey next takes us to a village in Zambesi where we're treated to another hand-waving, hip-shaking welcome. This community, though, has been hit hard by deforestation and desertification. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. Richard meets the elders and community stakeholders and initiates a discussion on strategic planning. We have been looking forward to coming and learning from you what you are doing to reduce the risks for the future. I've always thought in the city that communication was the absolutely vital ingredient of every chief executive. If you're trying to convince a board of directors that this new strategy is a good idea, it's not very different from trying to convince a group of village headmen if they took these measures then they could reduce the deforestation in their district. So uh, tell me how this works. What, After the community meeting, Richard gets a demonstration about how people create candles for home lighting. This prompts an unexpected discovery about what's growing wild under the most extreme conditions in the village's own backyard. So they discovered biofuel you know, two generations ago. <laughs> That's amazing, just amazing. 
Richard, this place is desolate. It's dry, it's hot, it's barren. Why are you so excited about it? We're actually standing in the middle of a biofuel plantation. This is Jatropha, these are the beans, and the people of this village have just been telling me they've known for more than two generations, they talk about their grandfathers teaching them, that they can make a candle with these beans. What they really don't know yet is that we can drive cars around in the west. So we're standing both in a problem for Africa and perhaps a solution. What this could do is the double whammy of reclaiming this barren lost landscape, stop it just degrading completely and offer that kind of economic fill-up that an economy like Ghana could do with. We've literally stumbled onto a natural biofuel field. It's a resource with untapped potential. If the community actually plants more of these trees, they can not only rehabilitate the land, but also revive the economy. There are opportunities, there are solutions. They need some careful thought and careful agreement and management with the community. But there are still ways in which business can be made to work to change those people's existence. Viable business opportunities like agriculture, like shea butter, like biofuel, can make money and improve lives here beyond a subsistence level of production. This in turn means that the people we've met will have cash to spend. It's a recipe for prosperity for Africa that Richard says can also be a recipe for profits for the companies that get involved. We're beginning to see fair trade making a significant impact and that is set to blossom. Richard got to the top at Aviva by being a shrewd businessman first and foremost. And this, he says, is the bottom line. Why businesses should engage in what's happening a world away. Probably the single biggest driving factor is their customers care. We have created climate change in the West. It's doing terrible damage across Africa. And I think as people increasingly understand that, they'll want the suppliers of the goods they consume to be playing their part in putting back and putting right some of that damage. During our week here, we've seen the struggles on the ground, the wasted land and the people living hand to mouth. But we've also witnessed the region's potential, the people optimistic and hard at work, the businesses starting up, the marketplaces emerging. The question now is, can Africa ever emerge as the next China or India? Richard says businesses need to wake up to that very real possibility. They overlook Africa at their peril. Africa has the capacity to create an African lion to chase the Asian tiger. This is the message that Richard is working to convey to his colleagues back home. That Africa is far from a charity case, and he hopes to inspire others to take the journey to find out. Hey, how are you? What I do know is I've been bitten by the bug. Hopefully some of my enthusiasm and some of the things I've learned can be shared by the wider audience that will be able to make a difference. So what I will be trying to encourage other CEOs to do is to take the two or three day slot in their diary, which might otherwise have been that trip to New York or the jetting off to Singapore, and actually just, just take it to come and have a look because seeing is believing. It is possible to get up close and personal in a very short time and they really get a feel for both what can be done and actually of course what to avoid.